Uh, before we dive into this, uh, quick show of hands. Uh, who here uses Docker? In production. Right. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone work at Docker? They're all out uh, waiting to ambush me after the talk. Great. Uh, yeah, my name is Corey Quinn. I'm with the Quinn Advisory Group, a uh, consulting group that solves exactly one problem, uh, fixing horrifying AWS bills. Um, if that's you, we should talk. Please feel free to tweet at me. Okay, so I've given this talk a few times now, and they fixed all the problems. Um, there's nothing new to talk about. And you've all heard about Docker, because the first rule of Docker is never shut the hell up about Docker. So I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not going to talk about Docker today. This talk is now called That Time My Boss Destroyed a Cubicle. And this is a completely true story. So let me take you back in time about 10 years. Uh, it was my first job as a Linux admin, and my new boss just started. And he's doing everything right. He's dressing well. He's getting in shape, and he's hoping to make a strong first impression. Uh, given what this story is called, you can safely assume that he did. So one morning, the strangest thing happens. Uh, we hear throughout the cubicle farm a shooka, 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 poof! Not typical office noises. So we all prairie dog over the side of our cubicles, and what we see, well, let me back up. In order to understand what it is that we saw, it helps to understand what caused the noise. In order to get in shape a little bit more effectively, my boss decided that he was going to go ahead and start having a lot of protein shakes. And that, okay, makes sense. Some people say yes, some people say no, we'll roll with it. And to stay alert, because let's face it, he worked in ops, he was drinking an awful lot of coffee. There's an optimization opportunity here. So to save time, he started mixing the two together inside of a sealed Tupperware container. And it didn't have an outgas valve. So here's a little known fact. If you remember absolutely nothing else from this talk, you can remember this. That if you mix coffee with SlimFast powder in a sealed container, it generates pressure. A lot of pressure. How much pressure? Well, it's not going to hurt anyone. But it is going to blow the lid off of a Tupperware container. So, yeah, that pretty much catches up to where we were in the story. We we'll peer over the cubicle wall and we see a complete disaster area where we have coffee and SlimFast all over his desk, all over his computer, all in his keyboard, the cubicle walls, and of course himself. And he stands there with the most forlorn, shocked, embarrassed, ashamed look on his face that you can possibly imagine. And a year later, when I left that job, the chocolate blast ring was still there. Now, great story. What's the point of it? It's not really relevant to anything at this conference. It's really just a story about someone who, despite knowing how his container worked, didn't understand how it could fail in production and what those failure cases might look like. And there's the metaphor. <laughs> so let's get back to the Docker talk. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out that sometimes doesn't get fully appreciated is that the purpose of this talk is not to tear down a promising new technology. It's to discuss some of the failure cases you can run into as you get it into production. Uh, every technology needs skeptics. As a disclaimer, I've used Docker myself before in production. I've given another talk this year, and I used Docker to give a number of demos in it. This talk doesn't have any demos because I couldn't find a Tupperware container. So why is Docker in production a challenge? Uh, before we get to the terrible aspects of it, let's just catch a few people up on what Docker is in case you've been asleep in a cave for three years. Uh, it's a relatively new container technology that Fortune 100 companies are going nuts over like 19-year-old college students on spring break. Uh, why? Well, terrific question. I'm glad I asked. It's because Docker is not only the best container technology out there, it is also the first ever operating system level container system. This has never been done before. Well, 
you know, except for LXC, which has been in the Linux kernel for over a decade. But Docker does leverage this. Or Solaris zones, which are about the same age. Uh, Docker didn't use to leverage these. I made fun of this in the first version of this talk. Someone released a patch. Docker can work with Solaris zones now. I don't know who's trolling who anymore. <laughs> and we also have to count jails as well. That's another form of container. But if we're going to include jails, then cheroots have to count, and they've been around since 1982, which is longer than some of the attendees here. And we can also include OpenVZ, which is effectively a cheroot on steroids. And that becomes a bunch of management tools baked in on top of it, so it counts too. Go far back in time far enough, you talk about logical partitions on mainframes, where you start segmenting things, which was an early form of, that's right, virtualization. For someone who wasn't in tech back in the noughties, uh, before we had Docker, 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 there was cloud, cloud, cloud. But back before then, there was vert, vert, vert. Uh, hype evangelists aren't new. They just tend to change form every few years. Which brings up Vagrant, which is probably of everything that we have on this slide, the closest to Docker in terms of mean time to dopamine. Namely, I have some code, and I want to get it up and running in the shortest possible window. Go. So if we concede the point that Docker is not the first container level system that works at the operation system, operating system level, then what makes it different? Apropos of absolutely nothing, these 10 investors have put in $180 million in funding. Uh, that, that's incidentally Docker itself, not ecosystem, which adds a few billion. Uh, now, I'm sure that none of that money has anything to do with the marketing or the hype. But again, the, the trouble is not with Docker itself. The technology is new, and it's awesome. The challenge is what Docker represents. Does anyone remember the concept of a three-tiered architecture? Uh, this is from the Stone Age, also known as about three years ago. You had a web tier where your web servers used to live. You had application servers that would do job processing. And you had database servers. And this was great. You knew where everything was. It was segregated. Systems could be placed deterministically. Oh, the app server is slow. Now I know where that is. I'm going to go look at it. Today, an architecture like this gets you thrown out of a job interview when you write it on a whiteboard. Because now we're talking about a tectonic shift to microservices where things live wherever the hell they want, and there's no guarantee that they're not going to move around on you at any given point in time. Unfortunately, going with a microservices-based architecture is not going to save you from yourself. But it might let you kick the can down the road a few years, and it could buy you some time. I'm going to stop here for a second and talk a bit about what a microservice is. Because an awful lot of people, despite using the term, don't know what it means, but they nod sagely whenever it comes up, uh, like me when I built this talk. So if anything could be said to be the church of Docker, it is microservices. That is what it's driving towards, a microservices-based architecture. And what's fun is there isn't a clear, universally accepted definition of what a microservice is. But they do have some defining characteristics. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. Instead of having a giant single application that's monolithic, you wind up breaking each function down into its own process. And you get those processes who can talk to each other over a standardized and versioned API, if there's a just and loving God. And this becomes very modular. So if you have a microservice in your environment whose sole job is to listen for re requests for how much inventory is in stock, it then turns around, takes that request, queries a database somewhere, and returns the number of units in inventory. Now, what that does behind the scenes becomes irrelevant when you can abstract it away as long as the API doesn't change. So I can change the database from MySQL over to Oracle. I can rewrite the entire thing in Scala instead of Python. Then I can go drown myself in the toilet. And because none of these things change how that microservice interfaces with the outside world, you wind up in a scenario where the rest of the application, and hence the rest of the world, doesn't care. 
The idea then is that these become environmentally agnostic. So you really do get closer to the dream of viewing your entire server farm as just a pile of resources, CPU, RAM, and disk. You can cohabitate completely different containers doing different things wherever there's room as long as the resources are available across your fleet. The great bonus that really drives this is it speaks to business needs where you can now break up your enormous engineering team into smaller groups that focus on different microservices. So a small team winds up being able to focus and iterate more rapidly on a small thing than 500 developers beating away at a monolith. That leads to a different problem. Uh, a group of whales is called a pod. A group of ravens is called a murder. And a group of developers is called a merge conflict. <laughs> and since you don't really know where everything winds up getting placed, Every outage becomes a fantastic game of who done it. it. Every outage is now a murder mystery. And I do want to point out that this is not, again, an exhaustive list of everything that makes a microservice. Um, one particularly dumb definition that annoys me to no end is it's not a microservice if it has more than 100 lines of code. OK. If I have a bash script that is one line, but 80,000 characters long due to the miracle of semicolons. OK, great. Have I just built a microservice? Yeah. And then Git Blame becomes this fun game called Who Touched It Last? It's going to be great. Everyone can enjoy that. And the last benefit of microservices is that your architecture diagram now looks like this piece of crap, which is much more impressive than a monolith when you've got an audience, be it at a job interview or at a conference. It's complex. And it's interesting, and it gets deeper. Strapping something like that into your servers as they stand today doesn't quite work. These architectures tend to assume certain things about your environment, that you can change aspects about it with API calls. Uh, so you run something underneath it all, like OpenStack, which runs on complexity, or AWS, which runs on money. This is an official OpenStack architecture diagram. This is why I drink and will be in the bar for the rest of the conference. I, I'm kidding. There's no way they're going to let me stick around after this one. So now you've got a layer of unclear complexity that rides on top of a different layer of unclear complexity, all in the name of a modern systems architecture. And this is sad. Weep for the state of operations. And weep for the sad puffy with coffee and slim fast powder stuck semi-permanently in his fur. How did we get here? The value of Docker and the reason that people like it and the promise that it has is it solves one problem spectacularly well. It makes your development environment look identical to production, even though a MacBook and an Amazon instance don't look that much alike. It solves the silo problem. This is what DevOps was built around. Uh, we're all DevOps here, right? That, that's totally a legitimate job title and not just a way to get a 30% raise by doing no actual work. Yeah, but the idea is you have developers write code, throw it over the wall to operations. Operations is concerned with running it, and life goes on, and everyone's happy, right? Development and production are now identical. It's flawless. Docker works in both places. The containers work the same way. And you've solved the, well, it works on my machine problem. Except you don't have to schedule containers on your laptop. They're just on your laptop. That's where they are. Problem solved. And Kubernetes and Mesos are very heavy. They're iterating rapidly. And they're very complex. They're the next frontier of the microservices revolution. These folks are eagerly awaiting your call if you work on either of those projects. And on top of that, you wind up with the other problem of networking. OK, I need to be able to performantly have data travel between a wide variety of containers. And you don't see a lot of people talking about the intricacies of Docker networking, specifically because for the same reasons you don't see people talking a lot about how sausage is made in the slaughterhouse. It's we're working on it is really where that tends to be left off, and it is getting better. But it's still slow. It still has edge case failures. And once you get into the weeds, it is terrifyingly complex. 
but it still just works on my laptop. Let's make it worse. In most traditional environments, you don't do migrations just with a, with a uh, knife switch cutover when you release a new version where everything winds up getting upgraded simultaneously. You, you phase things in and out in most environments at scale. You ideally instrument one the heck out of a few instances, put them up there and watch traffic on them so you can roll it back if you need to. This is known as canary analysis that a lot of shops do. And this is terrific right up until you get to the point where your latest deploy now requires a schema change or something like that, but you can't just phase in and out. So the, you now have a problem, which is solvable. And all of us at scale have already solved this problem in some way, but the problem now is if you completely change over to a new architecture, you get to resolve that entire problem again from scratch. And you're throwing away significant work and investment in your existing environment. Your old release process just became obsoleted and you're back to the drawing board. And your problem, if you work in production operations, are just beginning. We're now getting into the heart of it here. Has anyone here ever monitored an immutable infrastructure and lived to tell the tale? The tumbleweed, okay, someone, okay, one person there, sort of, okay, good, 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 awesome. We should talk. Instrumenting anything in a container-based environment that is actually immutable is fun. Uh, let's say that a system stops working, or God forbid, is slow. How do you get meaningful metrics and troubleshooting data out of it when, or solve a weird intermittent issue in a world where by the time that you're alerted to the problem, that container where it's happening no longer exists. You'd better hope that your logging and metrics data are enough to get to the root cause of this. And, oh, spoiler, Docker host names are randomly generated every time they get instantiated, which means that traditional things that depend on that not changing, like Nagios, means that you're in for a treat. Tied closely to monitoring is the wonderful world of supervision. Uh, process and container supervision are deceptively tricky things. Because sometimes, let's face it, processes die. And there's a giant pile of tooling that is built solely around this problem to ensure that they either don't do that, or if they do, they come back up really quickly. Uh, Docker does this, or tries to, and does it reasonably well. And so does System D and Supervisor D and Upstart and 16 other sets of tooling that are all trying to stand in the same place in the world. And that's part of the problem. Because by the time you're this point in your decision tree of how you're going to solve these various problems, you're rapidly approaching the point where your infrastructure is a beautiful unicorn that looks nothing like anyone else's production infrastructure. And none of this, incidentally, again, is even on the horizon for that Docker container you're doing your development in on your laptop. So historically, I was deep into configuration management. And now we get into the point of starting to manage configuration in an immutable infrastructure environment. Docker is increasingly, to some extent, seeing themselves as an answer to configuration management. That's wonderful. With respect, they are wrong. And as an example, where's the database endpoint that a particular container is going to talk to? Do you run a puppet agent or a chef agent inside of a Docker container? Please say no. You talk, into other, you talk about systems here about how configuration management traditionally works, and you wind up in a very interesting problem space because you generally have these systems registering themselves with some form of master. Then if you're going to take it away again, they have to deregister themselves automatically. It becomes a terrific orchestration headache that these systems, although they're starting to evolve in that direction, were never built to consider. And if you start having these immutable containers that don't change, then you just replace everything, and then what's the point of even having configuration management? And remember, this also has to solve for that rolling deployment obstacle that's still further down the stack. This also comes into the fun world that other places are starting to consider is how do you host your containers? So you've built an awesome container. It's perfect in every way. So where does a developer put it where I can get at that container 
and put it into production. Now, Docker is offering Docker Hub, private registries. You have Amazon playing in this space as well, and they're, like Amazon tends to do, eviscerating a lot of other players in this market. Oh, it just, we're just gonna charge you 10 cents a gigabyte per month forever, the end. Okay, great, that leaves very little oxygen for other places to, to work with in this space. Now, most people in this room don't care. Hey, you're gonna give me something for effectively free? I don't mind, I have no problem whatsoever with that. But these folks do. So once again, it's not clear what the path forward is for a revenue model in that context. There has to be another answer somewhere. But this is a technical talk, not a business talk. So we're almost out of room on the slide, which hopefully means the horror story is about to end. But this does turn into a code quality question. If where, what is the provenance of my container? If another group or development organization, in, or even another company, hands me a Docker container to run in production, it's very, very hard today for me to audit that container intelligently. And I'm not just talking about security audits. I'm talking about how was this built? What lives inside of this container? If I grab a container from public Docker Hub to run MongoDB, that's great on a laptop to test things out, but how was Mongo built? How was it configured? More to the point, does it make sense in my environment? Is the, are the defaults that the container author wrote something I would agree with? It's difficult at times to expose that, so I have to take it on faith. There are a number of talks here and at other conferences on the proper way to build containers. And thankfully, a very clear consensus has emerged on the right way to do it. All of the other talks on how to build containers are wrong. All I have to go on at this point is that my developer says, it's fine, shut up, take it, run it. It's probably fine. And so we're back into the territory of I have no idea what's running in production and is about to wake me up at three o'clock in the morning when it breaks. There's a failure of the trust model here, all of which ties into security, which finally completes this list. And I put at the end of this process because security is generally something you can just bolt on after the fact so it's not that big of a concern. <laughs> yeah, you laugh at that. You tell that joke at RSA, nobody laughs. <laughs> so let's pretend that for some reason, magically, a new SSL vulnerability comes out. Third party containers are everywhere in your environment. Some are statically linked. Which ones were patched? How do you patch them when it's a third-party container from some random source? Recently, which is getting better with the security scanning service, credit where due, but at the beginning of this year, something like 70% of containers available on Docker Hub were still vulnerable to Heartbleed. I have a Git container that I run for another, another uh, talk that I give uh, called Terrible Ideas in Git. The container itself is called Terrible Ideas, which can only makes it very clear, first off, that I don't patch this thing, it's just a series of Git repositories and we're done. Secondly, because it's on public uh, Docker Hub and it's called Terrible Ideas, obviously no fewer than 10 sites are running that thing in production. <laughs> so there you have it. A giant list of things that apply in production that don't apply in development. And by the time you have solved for each and every item on that list, you have an effectively unique environment, which means that no one else is going to have the same stack that you have in your environment. So, which means you've really gotta be on top of your game to be able to diagnose effectively when things break. If it's not working, if it becomes slow, what do you do now? And all of this gets at a myth that I want to take a swing at for a second here. This is the kind of problem solving and architecting for stupendous scale and tremendous, I guess, theoretic, approaching theoretical limits of hardware that Google, Facebook, Netflix, and Twitter all tend to deal with. And we believe as a group of operations people, that if one of these companies has come up with something, it is the right and true way to solve the problem. And it's not. 
it's they've built things for their constraints, not our constraints. Google can't light up a new service without 10 million people signing up for it on day one. Most of us don't have that problem. I was at a talk at a DevOps days a few weeks back, and Netflix gave a talk about how every developer they have works in production. They have full root access. Okay, interesting idea, I guess. And someone next to me is taking notes. I've got to try that. It's like, okay, Netflix streams movies, and you, oh, Jesus, you work at a bank. It's... <laughs> There's a different level of constraint for different companies. Not all of these things apply to you. Back when Netflix wrote a tremendous amount of tooling around AWS's environment back in 2008 or so, they did it because Amazon's tooling was terrible. This is not the case eight years later. It's not as terrible. It's kind of good. So if you're not trying to spin up enormous tens or hundreds of thousands of instances, you don't need to be able to do that to launch your crappy Twitter for pets equivalent. And here at the end, we really get to the idea of why Docker is relevant to me, who specializes historically in configuration management. It's a spectrum. It's not a binary. On one end of it, you have configuration managed everything. And on the other, you have immutable infrastructure. Virtually no shops are at either end of that spectrum. It winds up being a very broad range. Um, is the world moving towards immutable today? Absolutely. I don't think that anyone's going to seriously dispute that. But does this mean that configuration management is dying? I don't buy it. After everything that we've shown today, where we're with the caveats around running Docker in production, does anyone delude themselves into thinking that doing a forklift upgrade of their existing monolith into a microservices architecture is simple or straightforward? The categorical, the categoric example of this that did a terrific job of it was um, quick. It was, sorry, Intuit did this for TurboTax Online, which is awesome, and throws off billions of dollars in revenue a year. That buys you a lot of talent, a lot of time, and a lot of flexibility to solve very specific, very unique problems. Most of us don't have that luxury. I wish I had that problem. One of the more interesting things here, talking to people at Lisa and other conferences, is the idea of the hallway track, where people talk about what they're doing and how they've done it. Um, interesting projects, great successes they've had. But you know what you don't hear a lot of? A story that goes like this. Well, here's this problem I have, and here's how I attempted to solve it, and oh, wow, did that blow up in my face. It was terrible. Three people got fired. The only reason it wasn't four is because I blamed Ted, who's useless. Whew! It, <laughs> No one tells those stories, and those conference talks don't get accepted nearly as often. They talk about their successes. They want to say, and that's why we're awesome. P.S. Come work here. For, and the Docker still has serious, it's promising, but it has serious challenges. And there are assumptions baked into virtually every piece of software in your environment that were not accounted for, were not accounting for the idea of a stateless environment. Perfect example of this, RabbitMQ. You, let's say you spin up a Docker container. You want to run RabbitMQ in it, terrific. You mount a storage volume so it can persist its data to disk. Awesome, you stop the container. You start a new one that mounts that data volume and your data is freaking gone. What happened? Well, it turns out that RabbitMQ makes a very simple assumption as it starts. By default, it's going to persist to disk in a way that is reflective of the name of the host. You spin up a new container, the container's identification changes, it doesn't see its existing data. Can you get around it? Sure. But there's a number of implicit assumptions along those lines that are baked into an awful lot of the tooling that we take for granted. It becomes a problem. At a larger scale, let's talk about modifying your existing application to a point where you have wind up having no choice but to rebuild the entire thing tear it to pieces, put it back together again in a microservices environment. After it. I don't think anyone's going to buy it when you say, oh, that's easy and straightforward. You should do that. I want to give a few points uh, for shout outs here. Uh, the first version of this talk, I wasn't able to track this down. There was a great tweet that talked about the Docker cliff. It was hard to find because this wasn't the version that I saw originally. This is which is in many ways shockingly appropriate. 
Um, thanks to Tyler Fitch of Chef for helping me track this one down. It was awesome. And I also want to thank Mike Julian, whose book is coming out in the next year. Uh, he convinced me that my exploding container story would make a terrific talk. It was a great story, but he wasn't convinced that it could be turned into a talk. Yeah. <laughs> His book's coming out soon. It explains monitoring in a way that I can understand it, which really tends to help. Uh, you should definitely check it out. And lastly, I want to thank all of you for showing up and listening to me talk, despite the fact there are actually good talks going on and other tracks. Uh, thanks for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions, I'm thrilled to answer them. You can also tweet at me or accost me in the parking lot after the conference with the Docker employees. So <laughs> questions, concerns, what can I answer? Knock yourself out. So, thanks. <laughs>
And here's the ugly truth of reality to it. To some extent, all of our infrastructures are kludges and we're all learning. I'm not convinced that that ever goes away. Other questions, comments, snark, sarcastic questions. Your resume disguised as a question. <laughs> Thank you very much.